there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue on looking through the book of the prophet Amos. Hallelujah. The sheep herder. The sheep herder from Tekoa. Yes. On behalf of Alice and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Greetings. Who is the Word? The Word made flesh who dwelt among us. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, as I said, we're, we're continuing on. We're going to pick up to, uh, in, in this session in the sixth chapter of the book of Amos. Mm-hmm. So you might want to get your Bible, get it open to that. You might want to get a notebook and pencil or paper to jot down notes. I, I always want to remind you to, if something strikes you, you know, make a note of it so you can go back and have a nice long conversation with the Holy Spirit about it, because he is the one who was sent to lead you into all truth. Hallelujah. Give us understanding. And give you understanding. Praise God. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord yes. God. We thank you for this time that we have in your word. We thank you, Lord God, above all, for your word, you. the word that was made flesh who dwelt among us, Father, the gift of your son, Christ Jesus, the name given, the only name given by which men can be saved. Lord, I pray that you open the eyes of our hearts that we would see wonderful things in your word. Lord, these are these are perilous times, Lord. Lord, that you would that you would reveal things to us, that you would give us great understanding of the things that you have spoken and revealed. Yes, sir. Lord, and that you, by the power of your spirit working within us, would continually encourage us to be faithful to what you speak to us. And what what you speak to us, we would believe. And having believed it, Lord, we would confess it. And having confessed it, Lord, that we would live it. So we praise you and thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, uh, this may sound a little strange, but we're going to start today with a history lesson. Okay. History is good to have. Well, it, it because whether you realize it or not, all history is is story. That's right. Because the Lord our God, who, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who owns everything on the earth, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, is active in human history, always has been from the beginning and will be to the end. Mm-hmm. You know, it says, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God because they're spiritually appraised. Mm-hmm. We are to appraise all things spiritually. We are to look through the lens of the Word of God and see every event in, in history, all right, and get a revelation of what God was doing in that. So I'm going to go back to, uh, now most of us are probably too young to remember this, I I would imagine, although I was a war baby. Mm -hmm. Uh, Have you ever heard of the Maginot Line? No. No. (laughs) (laughs) The Maginot Line, it's it's, it's, it's shameful that uh, I think in, in most schools here in the United States and certainly in uh, other countries that we've spent time in, there's not a great emphasis on things like learning history. Mm-hmm. Although I don't remember who it was. I think it was a German general that said, if you, if you forget history, if you don't learn from history, you're condemned to repeat it. it okay? Right. Absolutely. The Maginot Line. Now, prior to the Second World War, France spent uh, 10 years, 10 years building a massive barrier hundreds of miles long, made up of concrete fortifications and weapon installations to protect them from invasions by the Nazi Nazi Germans, right? It was known as the Maginot Line, and it was named after France's Minister of War, Maginot, right? Now, that defensive work was designed and built massive to withstand aerial bombings, infantry attacks, Mm. tank attacks, and other artillery attacks, it also contained comfortable housing, living quarters for large numbers of French troops. Wow. Oh yeah, because I mean, they they were of the opinion that the Germany, Nazi Germany, proved to be a threat. So this was their preparation for it, and they built this this uh, Maginot Line, this fortified. You know, it was called one of the greatest uh, examples of. Preparation for war of, 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 of you know, of, uh, I guess, military function, military operations, mm-hmm. okay? So it wasn't well, it was just a line, it was a place. I think. Well, it's like, it's like, it's almost like, you know, it's the European version of the Great China Wall is oh, what it was, okay? okay? okay. 
Uh, it was it was considered at the time, and still is to this day, to have been one of the most formidable military projects in history. Mm. The French concrete was most likely reinforced by the proclamation of British Prime Minister Chamberlain, Harold Chamberlain, yes. um, when he returned from a meeting with Adolf Hitler in Munich in 1938, and he came back to England and said, there will be peace for our time. So what I'm looking at is the security that the Maginot Line gave France. Right, right. Coupled with what Chamberlain is coming back, Neville, Neville Chamberlain came back and proclaimed after meeting Hitler, there will be peace for our time. So the French were pretty much living in peace and comfort without a lot of concern mm -hmm. for the coming war. And it indeed was coming, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, to put it simply, the Maginot Line gave the French people a sense of security mm -hmm. and a comfortable attitude mm -hmm. until, until. until the Germans went right around it and came in and conquered France and occupied it throughout the war. Mm -hmm. They just went around it. See, there was, there was a gap in it, see? Chink in the armor. A chink in the armor, yes. Look that up in uh, First Kings. Mm. So th the point of all of this is, and the, and the reason I'm bringing this to light, is if you think that that's one of the greatest examples of false security mm. and comfort that the world has seen, I want you to consider this. Okay. Amos 6.1. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure in the mountain of Samaria, the distinguished men of the foremost nations to whom the house of Israel comes. The people of God were at ease in Zion and secure in the mountain of Samaria. They had that same sense of comfort and security that the French had, mm -hmm. and they were just as mistaken. Right. Okay? Let me just give you a little background on this. Omri was the king of Israel in the late 1800s, okay, and he, he, B.C., of course, mm -hmm. and he purchased land where they built, he built the city of Samaria, okay, and he made it the capital of the kingdom. So I'm talking about the north, Israel, the kingdom of Israel. Mm -hmm. He made it, he made it the capital. All right, now, that, that's found in 1 Kings 16.24. But if you read on to like the next verse, mm -hmm. you would read this. Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord and acted more wickedly than all that went before him, all who were before him. All the other kings, Omri was more evil than all of them. He's the one that established Samaria. Okay. And he made that the capital of Israel, right? Now, when he died, his son Ahab that's the Ahab of Ahab and Jezebel right, fame, right. or infamy is a better word. And when Ahab became king in Omri's place, and here's what the eternal word of God says about him. All right, I'm going to read from 1 Kings 16, starting at verse 30. So Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all that went before him. Hmm. That includes his father. Right, right. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. Wow. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Wow. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all of the kings that were before him. Mm. I mean, this is, he is the epitome of ungodliness in the kingdom of God. Here he is, the king of God, and he is creating a, a capital and building idols and, and, you know, worship centers to false gods. This is in a land that God brought them to, right? Mm -hmm. It's an abomination. Absolutely. So he, he built Samaria with all the idols and all. Mm -hmm. But he built his ivory palace there in Samaria. His ivory palace was a place of fame. That's in First Kings 22, it's there. All of this is from the word, right? Mm -hmm. 
Ahab and Jezebel worshipped and supported false gods and their false prophets. At the same time, they were persecuting and killing the prophets of God. I mean, if you're not familiar with this, you need to get into the end of 1 Kings. And read, because this is incredibly, incredibly important. Not just as history, but in an understanding of what is going on in the church today, right? Yes. So, because of their ungodliness, God raised up, he always will, raise up a prophet. Mm -hmm. He raised up a prophet, a prophet among prophets, whose name was Elijah. Good old Elijah. Good old Elijah. Now, you know what the king called Elijah? Here's a man that God sends with his word. His word is healing. His word is life. His word is true. His word is holy. Mm -hmm. So he sends Elijah with the word into the land here and up to, because remember, he had been out. God used him to speak and stop the rain from falling right. in that land, in, in God's land, for three and a half years, right. which created havoc and horror, right? Mm -hmm. God did it. Yes. By his word, spoken through Elijah. So now he sends Elijah back to the land because he's going to act upon this. And the first thing that the king, Ahab, says to Elijah is that you, you troubler of Israel. Yes. Woe until a, unto a people when they think that the word of God is trouble. I'm telling you the truth, right? When you take comfort in a wrong thing, the right thing will trouble you. That's true. Yes. And, and that Absolutely. is true. Yeah. And these are the things that we need to understand and be on guard against. So I, I just want to read something here. I want to read some, some verses from that. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you troubler of Israel? And he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Mm -hmm. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. The queen, I mean, they're sustaining all of these yes, false prophets, supporting right? Supporting all of them. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Mm -hmm. But the people did not answer him a word. You know, when God dealt with that pair, Ahab and Jezebel, the false prophets and all the idolatry, the greed, the lust still existed. Mm -hmm. Okay? And still provided false hope and security to those who chose wrong even to the time of Amos. Mm -hmm. That's why this is relative. To, because we've, as we've seen in past studies now, that all of this idolatry is still going on. This is a, a more than 100 years after mm -hmm. Omri and Ahab and Jezebel, and yet it's still going on. Even after that incredible encounter of Elijah with the false prophets up on Mount Carmel, mm -hmm. an incredible account, right? Yes. And yet still the people are worshiping these false gods. So now I want to get back into the ch chapter 6 of, of yes. Amos. But I just want to go through some highlights here. I'm going to read, okay, starting in verse 3. Okay. Amos says, do you put off the day of calamity and would you bring near the seat of violence? Those who recline on beds of ivory and sprawl on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. Who improvise the sound of the harp like and like David have composed songs for themselves. Who drink wine from sacrificial bowls while they anoint themselves with the finest of oils. Yet they have not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they will now go into exile at the head of the exiles, and the sprawlers banqueting will pass away. The Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts has declared, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and detest his citadels. That's his palaces. Right. Eh? Right. Therefore, I will deliver up the city and all it contains. And it will be, if ten men are left in one house, they will die. Then one's uncle or his undertaker will lift him up to carry him carry out his bones from the house and he will say to the one who is in the innermost part of the house is anyone else with you 
and that one will say, no one. Then he will answer, keep quiet, for the name of the Lord is not to be mentioned. For behold, the Lord is going to command the great house to be smashed to pieces and the small house to fragments. The horses run on rocks, or does one plow them with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into word wormwood. You who rejoice in Lodabar and say, have we not by our own strength taken our name for ourselves? For behold, I am going to raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, declares the Lord God of hosts. And they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of the Arabah. Okay, let me just, from the day of calamity. You know, there is still yet coming a day of calamity, yes. a, a day of calamity that the world has never experienced. That's right. I'm talking about comparable to Sodom and Gomorrah, mm -hmm. as destructive as the flood. Mm -hmm. It's called the great and terrible day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Ayom Yahweh, mm -hmm. all right? You hear the sound of the harp. You hear beautiful music coming out of a lot of church buildings. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that it's a pleasant sound in the ears of God. I'm telling you the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Because he declared in verse 8, I loathe the arrogance of Jacob and detest his palaces, his citadels. I don't know that God is as pleased with the, the big church buildings as mankind seems to be. You know, he the only church building that impresses us is the one that he's building. Jesus said, I will build my church. And Peter has shown us that Jesus will build his church out of living stones. He is not impressed by the massive cathedrals that mankind has built. You know why? This phrase here, you who rejoice in Lodabar and say, have we not by our own strength? What does Lodabar mean? I don't know. It's you don't know. Well, let me just... The bar is word. The bar, speak up here. <clears throat> I said the bar is word. The bar is indeed word. No, no word. That's exactly right. Lodabar, that's what it means in Hebrew. The bar is the Hebrew word for word or promise. Mm -hmm. They're the same thing, right? right? right. The, the, the Hebrew word low means no. There's nothing, right? Right, right? So when it says you who rejoice in low debar, that means they're rejoicing that there's no word. Wow. Now I want to tell you something. There's a lot of religiosity going on in the United States of America right now at this time. But the fact of the matter is I see less and less word. Oh. Church of Laodicea. There's no word in there. There can't be any word in there because the word's standing outside the door knocking. That's right. Absolutely. You know, we, we did a study uh, not, not long ago here out of Amos talking about people being blind, being unconscious of what's mm -hmm. going on. The, the fact of the matter is, but they're rejoicing in the fact that there's no word. Mm -hmm. Now, you, if you don't realize this, you're not paying attention that the word of God is becoming more and more offensive to the world. Here in the United States of America, as well as, I mean, we spent a lot of time in the United Kingdom, in, in Ireland, in, in traveling in Europe, mm -hmm. even in Africa, and it's not as great in Africa at the moment. Oh. But here in the United States, the Word of God is becoming, actually, and it is defined in a lot of places, as hate speech. That's right. You say, how can that possibly be? Pay attention. <laughs> Pay attention. You start talking about the things that God calls sin and people call you a hater. God is not a hater. God is a lover. For God so loved the world that he sent his word into the world. That's right. Because that's the only hope that mankind has. So how can they be rejoicing when there is no word? Because they want to hear what they want to hear. And the fact is, when we talk about the word of God, that has to be the word rightly divided. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, when he talks about, you know, you have to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman, and not being ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Mm -hmm. You can, if you wrongly divide the word of truth, if you pick and choose the pieces out of context that you want to say, because they tickle the ears, then you can turn the truth, a truth, into a whole line. Right. Now, I always use the example. So you can be accurate. Mm -hmm. I think one of the translations, maybe a translation I have, I'm not sure, says you have to rightly, you have to accurately handle the word of truth. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between being accurate and rightly dividing. Right. If I were to say to you that the Bible says there is no God, 
That's an entirely accurate statement. Absolutely. That's absolutely accurate. Because it says that. It is. It's not true. No. Because it's wrongly divided. That's right. What it says when you don't wrongly divide it is that only the fool says in his heart, there is no God. That's so, the whole truth. Absolutely. Although, so I'm going to tell you, I've been in a lot of churches where I see the word of God wrongly divided, or I just see the word of God just ignored. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have shared with you, uh, you know, a few years ago, a number of years ago, Alice and I were in, in a, uh, a large church in Texas, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. yes. um, okay, I'm not going to sing raindrops. Okay, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be offend anybody. But the fact of the matter was that the pastor there, now, I'd never met this man. I'd never been into this church. We were there as visitors because of somebody had asked to go to go with him. And he preached a sermon, 20 minutes, 20 minutes on the button, because you got to get it three times, you know. And if you're more than 20 minutes, uh, people will get upset and tired of hearing. Not like the days when Paul could preach for hours and hours and hours. Or Smith, okay, I'm not going to go there. But the point is, the thing that he preached, the message that he preached, was absolutely inaccurate scripturally. Yes. And when I say inaccurate, it's not just that it didn't line up with the word. It was in direct contradiction to something that Jesus had taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolute contradiction. Now, this was a very, very large church. Now, that's why they had divided into, I think, three services to handle the crowd. So at the end of the service, I walked up to him, and I, I said, again, I don't know this man from anybody, but I said to him, I, you realize that what you were saying is in contradiction to what Jesus said here in the Sermon on the Mount. And he looked at me and he said, well, I'm glad to see somebody still has a zeal for the Word of God, turned and walked away from me. That should have been more shocking to me than it was. The only problem is I've had too much experience like that, okay? You can go to a church and listen to somebody preach for their 20-minute session, and it's not necessarily the Word of Truth. Not the Word of Truth particularly in the days that we live in. This is what the Apostle Paul, again, wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he talks about in the last days, men will not endure sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. So what they will do is they'll accumulate for themselves teachers who will teach according to their own desires, tickling their ears, turning away from the truth and teaching myths. Okay? So how do you know if what you're hearing is the truth? How do you know if what you're hearing is the word rightly divided? There's only one way. Test it against the word. Yeah. You have to be abiding in the word. It's not like you can casually say, you know, kind of scan and flip pages and see if you hit it right. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, if you continue in my word, you're truly my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And if you have the word in you, the Holy Spirit will, will send up red flags. Absolutely. When there's something that's non scriptural. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, what I want to do is I want to, I'm going to skip over to chapter 7, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to read verses 7 and 8, because there's something I want to deal with here okay. that is ever so important, too important, I'm not going to get enough time to talk about it. This is Amos 7, 7 and 8. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, behold, I am about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will spare them no longer. Mm. I'll tell you, God is not a, a, a man that he should change. Yeah. If he did it once, he can do it again. And he will do it. The thing about a plumb line, a plumb line is a string with a metal weight on the end, right? And when, it, when you hang it, when you suspend it like that, it always points directly to the earth's Magnetic center oh. or, or gravitational center. Oh. Always. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what country you're in. That plumb line, you know why? Because it works on God's law of gravity. Amen. Okay. Yes. It, won't, it won't give you one answer today and a different answer tomorrow. It's not subject to change. It's not subject to change. That's what God was saying. He was putting a plumb line. The only thing that is that straight line that is trustworthy all the time is God's word yes. revealed to you, giving you understanding by the Holy Spirit. Right. Okay. 
you can get the word from teachers. That's why I say test me, right? And it can be an inaccurate statement, okay? God spoke to the prophet Isaiah. I'm going to read Isaiah 45, 19. And he said, I have not spoken in secret in some dark land. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in a waste place. I, the Lord, speak righteousness, declaring things that are upright. What does a plumb line test to see if something is upright? When you're building a house or building a wall, you put it next to the wall to make sure that it's upright, that it's not slanted or crooked. It's not going to the left no. or to the right. It's not going to the left or the right. It, it, that's what God is going to do. No, no, no. That's what God is doing. Yes. That's what God did before. That's what God is doing now. He is putting a plumb line up to see if people in the church is upright. Yes. The church of Laodicea, the last picture of a church in the Bible, could not pass that test, I mm -hmm. want to tell you. You know, because what God is looking for is normal Christianity. That's right. Not common Christianity. The difference between normal, by the way, comes from the Latin word for a carpenter square. Again, something that is an object of truth that cannot you know, used in building. God uses God uses the plumb line and the carpenter square in building his church. That's right. And make sure, because you know what happens if it's off? You tear it down. That's right. So slaps it back on the mold, That's right. on the uh, so, right. so we're not looking for common, because what happens is all too common. The way people talk, the filth that comes out of their mouth, the filth that's on the television, on the radio, in the movies, that's common. I promise you that by the standards of God, it most assuredly is not normal. That's right. Not normal. Mm -hmm. You had better test yourself. Let a man examine himself and make sure that you are living a life that God considers normal. Led by his spirit, directed by his word, a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. You have to get away from being common, yes. okay? Doing what everybody else is doing. God is about to blow the trumpet. God is bringing judgment. Now, I'm just I'm going to say this because I'm I'm running out of time, so you can't throw stuff at me and hit me. I'm going to say this. Mm -hmm. Forty years ago, I was preaching and teaching that God was going to bring judgment on this country, That's right? Because this country was being disobedient mm -hmm. to His word. And I said, I don't know how many years ago, 10 years ago, I don't know, I'm not sure, I stopped preaching that. I no longer said that God is going to bring judgment because I said God has brought judgment. Look at this land and tell me that God has not brought judgment on it. The destruction of family life, the destruction of the education system, the, the, the sewage pit that the political system has... Mm. God has brought judgment. There's a way for you to escape. Hop in the lifeboat. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Get into the word so you get to be normal. Amen. Hallelujah. We're out of time. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the time that we do have. And Lord, it has to be your spirit that quickens us to us. Yes. It has to be your spirit that leads us in these paths of righteousness, Lord God. It has to be your spirit that directs the path of our feet. Lord, help us not to be arrogant, but to surrender to you day by day, to submit to you, to do your will, not our will, to desire to be normal by your standards, not common by the world's standards. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, in these perilous last days. Amen. Amen. Well, until next time, we just want to bless you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you. Jesus loves you. Cherish that old rugged cross till my trophies are the best I may die. I will cling to that old. Thank you.